When you catch this early, the treatment outcome is different. So let's talk mm -hmm. about proactive treatment and when in those cases might RFA be appropriate? If we just go back a couple of years before RFA was uh, available and approved uh, here in the United States, you had basically uh, two options when there was a diagnosis of thyroid cancer. If it was small and if other certain factors lined up, uh, there was a push to say, well, how about we don't do surgery until we see if this is one of those aggressive kinds. The name that got put on that was active surveillance. Um, not crazy about that name um, because active surveillance isn't much more active than surveillance or observation. But what you were looking for, if you had a small thyroid papillary cancer, that you would look to see if it's growing, expanding, or spreading, and then you would treat it. And the advantage of that is if you had one of those small thyroid cancers that were never going to harm you, then you didn't have to undergo any treatment that might harm you. And the idea was, was maybe we'll cut down on unnecessary surgery by not taking out thyroid cancers that aren't going to hurt you. Now, the problem with active surveillance is that it works great if it is one of those less aggressive kind of cancers. But for those people where it's not, you're getting them at a later stage. Yes. So you can't be proactive anymore. Right. <laughs> now you may need a bigger surgery to get yeah. a cure than before. And while you still may survive, there's those issues with morbidity and that delaying treatment may have cost you your entire thyroid or made you undergo a neck dissection that you wouldn't have undergone if you treated that really early. So I've never been a big fan of active surveillance, um, but there are people, uh, for instance, at Sloan Kettering who are studying this very carefully and trying to sort out, well, how do we know who's a really good candidate for that? But active surveillance is kind of no treatment. And then our other option was surgery. So now that RFA has come along, now we have something that maybe isn't really passive, like active surveillance. We have a way to treat a, a small papillary thyroid cancer and then continue to watch it, right? But instead of doing nothing and watching it, we can treat it, watch mm -hmm. it, and then if we have to, we can do surgery later yes. if it looks like it's more aggressive. It's not necessarily a substitute for surgery. It's, it's a step before surgery, potentially. It can be. Okay. Mm -hmm. In so certain if cases. We, it, let, yeah, let's just take a, a, a patient who has a small papillary thyroid cancer, let's say a one centimeter papillary thyroid cancer. They could wait to see if it spreads or if it grows or if it shows up in multiple places in their thyroid and then have surgery. Or they could do an RFA procedure on that spot and then continue to watch. And if it shows up in any of those other situations, you can still do surgery and right. RFA doesn't change the ability to have surgery, nor does it increase the risk of having surgery. So it's, to me, it's a no brainer because you, you're not losing any ground. You're not, you're not increasing risk in terms of surgery later, um, but you have the opportunity, instead of just watching it, you can actually do something. And there's no system. burned bridges. <laughs> there's no burn bridges with RFA. Yeah. Um, now, other people had tried some other treatments in the past and those haven't worked out. Um, but RFA is an excellent option. Part of this, too, is, is to say, well, wait a minute, is this a proven therapy? Um, RFA is new to the United States, but um, as you know, it is not new, right? So they've been doing it in South Korea for more than a decade. And there are a growing body of papers, literature, scientific literature. And let me just tell you about one, and there's multiple of these that we could talk about, but just for brevity, um, there's a South Korean study that looked at 77 patients that they treated. Now, these were biopsy-proven papillary thyroid cancers, and all 77 people got uh, RFA. Every single one of those people were followed for at least five years, and some of them for seven years, and out of the 77, there were zero recurrences. So that's pretty stunning. Yes. Zero out of 77, all 77 effectively treated and five to seven years of nothing else showing up. So that sounds really good. Even more remarkable in this study was two thirds of those patients at the three year mark, you couldn't see on ultrasound where their cancer used to be. 
Wow. Yeah. Now, these were small papillary thyroid cancers. They weren't large papillary thyroid cancers. Mm -hmm. They were very, very early stage. But the point of that is that it absolutely did, a RFA did a wonderful job of not only treating these things, but then not seeing progression down the line. I have to just put a caveat in here that in South Korea, they will biopsy things that are really small. Right. So they were picking up small, even sub-centimeter thyroid cancers in this type of study. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, if you got it early and you treat it with RFA, they had 100% cure rate. And, and 77 patients is a decent sampling. Yeah. There are other papers that have even more patients, but the reality is, is that for small thyroid cancers, RFA seems like an excellent treatment option. No one has done the studies and no one has presented this to the FDA. So this is not an FDA approved therapy like we have with benign thyroid nodules, but it, from a scientific point of view, it definitely seems like it is a reasonable thing if we select the right patients mm -hmm. for it. My question then is, if we believe that this could potentially become an FDA approved procedure for these types of cancers, then do you believe the protocol for biopsies will change as far as when do we do biopsies? Because currently we're not biopsying anything under a centimeter. Yep. And that is an awesome question, okay? Because RFA is sort of changing the way we think about this. The reason we weren't biopsying small thyroid nodules was because we were saying, well, the treatment is surgery and we don't want to be having a lot of unnecessary surgery. RFA is so minimally invasive that then I think you really need to rethink, okay? Um, because if you can get these early and treat them by RFA, well, you can have a working thyroid and the cancer's gone. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see as we move forward and as more of this data is accumulated, what the thinking will become. Uh, the drive towards using those one centimeter and bigger criteria was to reduce the number of unnecessary surgeries. But RFA can reduce the number of unnecessary surgeries. Um, and if we get these earlier, maybe we can get even better outcomes. All right. But remember, we're, we're really comparing it against something that's highly effective, which is surgery. And the bigger the, the cancers get before we see them, the lower those numbers go. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just a steady progression downward in terms of cure rates. If you let it get to stage three or stage four, you don't have those super high cure rates. I'm a big proponent of early intervention where things are easier. Mm -hmm. And while um, I, I enjoy doing surgery and I think I'm good at surgery, um, I would much rather get a patient to a cure with a simple 40 minute operation than a four hour operation. And you know I that their much... quality of life is going to be very different the yeah, earlier yeah. you can intervene. Absolutely. And I'd much rather get them taken care of with a non-operative option yes. if we have that, in which with RFA and the right candidates, we do, mm -hmm. okay? And let me just clarify that just a little bit. Um, there are some situations where you would never opt for, let's say, that active surveillance, yes. right? So if it, within the thyroid, if it was really close to the windpipe or really close to where the nerve going to your voice box is, those aren't things that you would sort of sit on and observe. And so those, those particular locations might not be good for RFA either because you wouldn't observe them because if you're wrong, it can invade that nerve and now you have a permanent disability. If it's really near the windpipe, it could invade your airway and now you've got a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. Or you face the idea that maybe part of your windpipe has to be removed surgically. Okay. okay. And so we're talking about much, much higher morbidity things. And so yeah. in certain locations, even a small thyroid cancer can be an ominous thing as we look at it. And so we wouldn't observe those. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a small one that's sitting right in the middle of the meat of the thyroid, meaning there's a big rim of thyroid all around. And if it spreads a little bit, it's not going to get into the windpipe. It's not going to get into the nerve. Then those would be good candidates for observation or even better RFA. Mm -hmm. So it's not just size, it's location. 
Um, and then there's a few other factors. There's a gene uh, that's called BRAF. I know you've heard of it. BRAF is an ominous sign. If you have a BRAF positive tumor, and when I say genetics, by the way, I don't mean your genetics, like your chromosomes, like you would get from 23andMe. Um, it's actually the tumor genetics. So okay. if you take a biopsy of a tumor and it has this BRAF mutation in it, um, the chance of you having cancer is better than 99%. Wow. Okay. So not only is it an ominous sign for cancer, but we know that BRAF cancers, they spread within the thyroid earlier than other cancers, and they spread to the neck more often and earlier than other cancers. So we know in BRAF's case that that's going to be a more aggressive cancer. So BRAF, and we are talking about just papillary. Okay. Wow. So BRAF can occur in other cancers and other parts of the body even, mm -hmm. but I'm talking specifically within okay. papillary thyroid cancer mm -hmm. that a BRAF positive is going to act more aggressively than a non-BRAF. Okay. You would really have to have a long discussion with a patient who wanted to do RFA on an aggressive BRAF papillary cancer. And in my mind, I don't know. I wouldn't want to take a chance. I mean, and you know, the ultimate litmus test for me is always, what if it was in my neck? What would I do? Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen enough aggressive BRAF cancers to say that if I had a BRAF cancer and I got it early, I'd want that thing out. I mm -hmm. wouldn't take a chance on microscopic spread. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so maybe BRAF cancers aren't the ones um, that we would look at with RFA. Now, the non-BRAF, those are the ones that, are, that could potentially just sit there and do nothing. Those are really good candidates for RFA. As we learn more about the genetics, and we have a few others, there's some RAS um, mutations, and the RAS mutations, they're not nearly as aggressive. They don't spread early like the BRAF mutations do. Um, there's some others that I won't bore you with all the technical terms there. But as we get more and more honed in on the genetics, I think we'll be able to sort out better, you know, who's likely to have that less aggressive cancer that RFA would be perfect for. Mm -hmm. And then who is it that mm -hmm. still needs that surgical intervention because theirs could become truly life-threatening or quality of life-threatening? Yes. There's a range here, and I know it's complex, and realize, too, that we're kind of talking here for a few minutes, but, you know, we go to conferences, and we talk about this stuff all day long for yes. hours, and the, the complexities, as we learn more, it gets a little bit more complex, but what's really exciting about that is it also gets more clarifying. So just a few years ago, when we weren't really that familiar with BRAF, we treated kind of all those cancers the same. And now, at least if we know there's a BRAF, we know, okay, let's be more careful with this one. Let's watch it closer. Let's, if we can't intervene soon, then let's be a little bit more aggressive in our surgery to try to clean out that whole neck area because we know there could be microscopic spread there. If it's a non-BRAF, then okay, the pressure's off. We can maybe do half of the thyroid instead of the entire thyroid. We will know more and more as we follow the research that's being done on all these genetic markers. And hopefully we understand better where the aggressive cancers are and where the less aggressive cancers are so that we can make good choices.